Good afternoon, audience uh, in the room here with us and at home. It's lovely to have you all here. I'm Susan Wyndham, and I'm delighted to welcome, welcome you to this session today with Tom Keneally talking on what is evil. Is there evil, perhaps? <laughs> Uh, before I introduce him, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of this land and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. And I've been asked to just mention a few housekeeping things. I'd like to thank the City of Sydney and the State Library for supporting this session today and the whole BAD festival. Uh, you know all the COVID <laughs> restrictions which you're applying right now, so I won't go through that. Please mute your mobile phones, don't record the session and turn off your flash if you're taking photos. You can share on social media, uh, media at BAD Crime Sydney, hashtag BAD Crime Sydney. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions after Tom's address. And uh, if, you're at, if you're here, I will repeat your questions so that people at home can hear. And if you're at home on Zoom, um, please start sending your questions through any time. Don't use the chat function this today. Um, use the Q&A function on your computer on Zoom. Thank you. And now to turn to Tom Keneally who, as you all know, is a great Australian writer, historian and citizen, and a friend. <laughs> he has published almost 60 books, possibly more by now, as well as plays and screenplays, and he's still writing and publishing almost every year. His latest novel, which was out this year, is The Dickens Boy, based on the true story of Charles Dickens' sons who moved to Australia. Last year, he and his daughter Meg Keneally published The Ink Stain, the fourth in their series of Montserrat mysteries set in colonial Australia. You'll be very pleased to know that they're working on the fifth Montserrat book right now. And next year, Tom will publish another novel as yet untitled, which begins in his childhood town of Kempsey in northern New South Wales as Hitler rises to power in 1933. In his own life, Tom's generally on the side of good, whether as a grandfather, a supporter of asylum seekers, or by establishing the Tom Keneally Center with a collection of his books at the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts, where he gives regular talks and writing workshops. Tom's early sense of good and evil was inspired, or not, not inspired, I would say more imprinted by the Christian brothers at school and by his time at St. Patrick's Seminary at Manly before he decided he was not cut out to be a priest. I've been looking back at his first novel, The Place at Witten, which was published in 1964, a psychological mystery about several murders at a Sydney Catholic <laughs> seminary. The story, which is better than Tom thinks it is, has damnation, madness, black magic, feckless evil, and several gory deaths. But even then, there was an ambiguity to just who were the goodies and the baddies. And Tom, the man and the writer, has continued to become more complex and more compassionate, I think, in his creation of individual characters in his books. His writing has often been about confrontations between good and evil, and often the evil is caused by excessive power, whether it's the Nazis in his Booker Prize winner Schindler's Ark, or again, the Catholic Church in the 2016 novel, Crimes of the Father, or often in his books, The World's Endless Warring and Colonizing Forces. So there's really no one more qualified to give us a fascinating talk on what is evil. And I'd like you please to welcome Tom Keneally. Thank you all and welcome all the people at, uh, at home. Um, I should tell you how this session began. It began with Catherine, who we've all met. Catherine with the really posh French name, <laughs> Menage de Palou, or, <laughs> and uh, uh, th these are sort of names boys from Homebush aren't used to, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, she, uh, I, I said to her, if I, I ever gave a talk at a 
mystery writers convention if i was ever a distinguished enough mystery writer to be invited i'd talk about whether some of the sting has gone out of murder now that we know that evil is pathological a medical condition as well as a theological condition and uh, this uh, a condition of satanic malice deliberately chosen. And uh, that's what she said she'd like me to talk about. So this is the, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, weakening of power, uh, sorry, the weakening that's taken place in the identity of evil over, in the way we identify evil over my lifetime and some early templates of evil that really, in literature, that really hit me when I was young. And how writing about bad people, people who murder now, uh, has been changed by this. And I've even got daring enough to have a couple of tips, uh, you know, fancy giving a couple of tips to, to the, some of the people that are here that are such accomplished mystery writers. But uh, I think there are things we should strive to, to undermine the inherent weakness in our novels and in the mystery novel. Now, uh, don't be offended by inherent weakness because everyone's got them. Uh, just as our personalities have inherent weaknesses, so do novels. So as a young reader, I didn't encounter the conventional mystery. I encountered Sherlock Holmes, of course. And that's true of a lot of people of my generation. Uh, there was basically a few mystery writers. There was Nio Marsh and, of course, the um, uh, uh, people of, of uh, that ilk. There was a professor of English, an English professor of English fr from Adelaide University who did that. Oh, now, as soon as I've mentioned him, I've forgotten his name, but he wrote a series of detective stories. Uh, in Innes, was it? Uh, Idris. No, not, not Idris, Idris, no. Uh, but he, he wrote a very successful line of uh, the man whose name I've forgotten and therefore... <laughs> uh, this is the this is the problem of giving a talk when you're old. <laughs> I really admire the work of what's his name. That's about <laughs> <what I'm talking. laughs> So we we didn't encounter the mystery as much as our first reading, and of course, then I read uh, the 1859 novel, The Woman in White. Now the reason I read it was because I saw a black and white film, The Woman in White, in 1947. This means about puberty, I was starting to notice how good-looking movie actresses were. And there was, uh, in The Woman in White, based on Wilkie Collins' um, uh, novel, uh, the um, the woman is startling and handsome, but there is a wonderful performance of the chief baddie, Count Bosco, uh, by Sidney Greenspan. And it really uh, hit home to me. And I read the book, and it's been an enduring influence. I noticed just in relation to my book on, on um, the... Uh, Dickens' boy, that Dickens named his sons after uh, great writers. So there was Edward Bulwer Lytton Dickens, who lived in Wilcannia. There was Alfred Tennyson Dickens, who lived in Hamilton in Victoria. But there was never, even though Wilkie Collins was one of his best friends, there was never a, say, Samuel Wilkie Collins Dickens. On the other hand, Dickens spent a lot of time with him prowling around France. So I surmise from this that Wilkie Collins was a bad boy too, but good fun to be with. And um, therefore, this novel is kind of the first thriller in English literature. 
and it's a wonderful piece of work, but both the villain in Sherlock Holmes and the villain in The Woman in White are irremediable demons. They have not been abandoned by the light. They have not abandoned the light because of some damage that was done to them by their kindergarten teacher or by a high school teacher or by a malicious aunt or by whatever they have abandoned um, uh, they have abandoned the good because they love the evil count fosco has been a member of a sort of group of republican angels in italy who were on the side of reform and renewal but he's deliberately abandoned that to become a spy for the oppressors and similarly you have in, in Sherlock Holmes, you have, um, of course, that villain who's um, barely mentioned. I mean, he's not in a lot of the stories, and yet he's built up by the skill of Conan Doyle as a writer into something more than uh, something elemental, an elemental principle of evil. He's not only the... Napoleon of crime, as Sherlock Holmes says, but he is, um, he, I, I'm trying to find the uh, description of him here in, uh, in Conan Doyle, and I'll find it in a moment, but he's not bad because of some childhood trauma, some enduring false turn that's been imposed on him by a superior power when he was young. He's bad by his own agency and by his own nature. James Moriarty, the way Count Fosco's been a goodie when he was young, similarly, James Moriarty found a groundbreaking uh, mathematical formula and has been a professor of mathematics. But he turned away from that to be depicted as he is the organ organizer, says Holmes, of half that is evil and nearly all that is undetected in this city. But Conan Doyle is, is this contented with describing him just as that. He's stri trying to strive for something more elemental and pervasive. So he says he is a genius, a philosopher, an abstract brain. He has a brain of the first order. He sits motionless, says uh, Conan Doyle, uh, to depict Professor James Moriarty. He sits motionless like a spider at the center of his web. And that web has a hundred, a thousand radiations. And he knows very well every quiver on each of those strands. So like yin and yang, when when he and um, Holmes fall over that uh, Reichenbach Falls, apparently to their death, Holmes and he in an embrace, it's like yin and yang, it's like good and bad, elemental good and elemental bad, bad falling off a cliff together in each other's grasp. It's an image, of course, of what we all try to achieve. That's what we, uh, we're talking about when we write about a good man a good flawed man or woman trying to find an elementally bad man or woman who is guilty of the crime we've set up so carefully in, in the book. Uh, it, it's a good image of what uh, we become. Fosco shows that he's elementally bad so often in The Great Woman in White. And I recommend the... Um, Alexis Smith figure who made such an impact on the heart and maybe a few other parts of the anatomy of the 13 year old Tom Veneer. <laughs> uh, the, um, <coughs> he is uh, talking with the other baddie, a minor baddie, Sir Percival Glyde, uh, 
Now, uh, given that he was a mate of Dickens, that's a great Dickensian name for a baddie, Sir Percival Glyde. Uh, Sir Percival says that the lakes in his estate, the little lake is suitable for a murder. And Fosco answers, <clears throat> as he always does such an assertion, with a sonatic, uh, with a satanic and not a genially informed insight. He says, my good Percival, what is your solid English sense thinking of? The water is far too shallow to hide the body and there is sand everywhere to print off the murderer's footprints. It is upon the whole, the very worst place uh, for murder that I've ever set my eyes upon. So this is a man who is so evil that every sight is judged by its capacity to hold undetected for as long as possible a dead body. Now, World War II comes and all these damaged um, men come back, some of whom have done dreadful things to POWs and so on, and the question of evil comes out with the SS and the Nuremberg trials, trials and there's a lot of examination of um, the influences upon ordinary men who committed uh, satanic, if I can go on using that good old Christian word, it's a good adjective, satanic, but if I can go on using the, uh, uh, that term as if I <laughs> believe in it, the satanic uh, evil, we find, we, we find there are, is a tracking of the emergence of evil in SS men. They've committed pure evil, but the evil has been conjured up by Hitler, of course, and even with Hitler, if he had got into the Vienna School of Arts, <laughs> where, which he thought was run by Jewish influence, if he'd got in there, would there have been a Holocaust? Even with him, these questions are asked. Even with Stalin, the question of Stalin's alcoholic father and the beatings that he dished out, which were a perfect prelude to the purges that uh, Stalin committed and the gulags that he imposed on so many prior to their deaths. Uh, even Stalin wasn't a thorough baddie anymore. And we had to uh, explain why childhood, which was more or less invented by people like Dickens, we went back to childhood, psychiatrists did, and all we people who read the psychiatric features in the daily paper, we become, became pop psychologists and we have to explain why people are bad. And I suggested this topic to Catherine after I'd um, had an experience with my daughter making up something about a man called Diamond who recurs throughout the book. And he's one of those blokes, when I was writing a history of Australia, I found there were blokes who set their mind to the invention of better cats and nine tails so that if the thing was laid on by the convict flogger, even with half a will, it would still do great damage. And there was such a man in charge of the barracks who designed a new cat of nine tails, uh, so diabolic, a good, another good theological term, <laughs> so, so diabolic that it, it, even if you only, if you were, the flogger was the mate of the bloke on the triangle, it was still doing great damage to uh, the skin, tendons, and in some cases, even to the bone of uh, the floggy, the man flog. So in uh, convictism, there's, makes you something that almost, almost makes you believe in sat sat satanic, unrelieved evil. Uh, but then there are blokes who use that flash, who avoid using it. There are magistrates who avoid using it. There are commandants <coughs> who, are, who avoid using it because 
there was a great uh, variation between Tories and progressives, great variation of opinion on what a convict was. The progressives tended to look upon them as more as we look upon a convict, and the Tories looked upon them as integers in a criminal class that must be redeemed somehow, but redeemed by punishment, not by remediation. There's still, still the same argument rages, of course, in, uh, in how we treat um, convicts. And um, the, uh, we, so the story of what happened with my daughter, we've got this man called Diamond, who's one of these more invented new and better cat and nine tails sort of blips. And he, uh, we said to each other, what was his background that explains that he wanted to be the mongrel that he was? And we ended up giving him a, a childhood as a tanner, a tanner's son in an industrial part of Manchester, say. And the tanner does well but Tanner's work stank the high heaven, and those who worked in them had to wash a lot every day so they could even score a girlfriend. And so he's a Tanner's boy, his father is a Tanner, and he's been a subject of derision to bigger and other working class boys around him, even though his father ultimately earns enough to buy him a commission in the days when you bought a lieutenancy if you wanted to be an officer. And then you bought, they were advertised in the daily newspaper. And uh, so this is how he is an officer. And we explain his malice in terms of he has, having been teased when he was a boy. And I said to Meg, isn't it funny? In the 19th century, you didn't have to work out what happened with the kid. Count Fosco was just bad. He grew bad. He was bad. He was bad from his mother's womb. James Moriarty was. He wanted to be at the center of the spider web. That spider web. But often in the modern novel, the murderer would very much love to be the detective. And there's something in the detective that speaks to the murderer as well, as I, uh, as I say. And so uh, this tendency we have, and it's valid to do now, to say that your victim was destroyed in childhood by various, um, by various uh, 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 factors, but it makes their crime a pathology to repeat a, a medical event almost, a medical symptom more than an outlay of evil. And if you explain the crime away too much, you end up with a damaged child, Hitler, the damaged child, instead of Hitler, the universal monster. And that's a problem for us because we like the idea, as children, we like the idea, my daughter, who writes these with me can remember the time she said to uh, Justice Nagel, uh, a very liberal judge of the Supreme Court who came out to Avalon to visit us, she said, did you hang any burglar, burglars this week? <laughs> and he said, oh, no, we, you know, we tried to talk and then <laughs> education, <laughs> remediation. <laughs> and this five-year-old, just wasn't interested in that. She said, uh, well, I hope you've sent someone to jail at least. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, uh, we, re we remain that child who wants to believe in universal evil. And the great thing is that in a really well-read detective story, someone has died, it could only be one death, it can be someone we don't even particularly mourn, and yet on the principle that every life is sacred, we invest emotionally in this murder, 
And until the killer is revealed, the sky is full of threat, the streets are full of threat. And that threat is the universal threat of the substance of peril, of danger, of undue danger, of sin, of the worst sin, the sin of pain, the worst sin you can commit. And it stains the sky and it stains the town and it is breathable in the air. And then the murder is solved. And this is the problem that we have to do our best to defeat. Suddenly, the murderer is not universal evil. The sky is not full of universal threat. It's Bert Jenkins who drives a bus, or Bert Jenkins who, or, or, or uh, Madeline Conroy, whose husband left for us. And she's nearly as big a victim as the murder victim. And therefore, we have to both talk about the, the modern killer in realistic terms, showing the influences upon them. We know that social influence is everything. We see it in the 17th of the overwhelming 17th of Aboriginal in Australian jail. So being a member of the social class and an ethnic group can increase our chances of being seen as a demon. So we now know it's all very subtle with our demons. And therefore, to make the revelation memorable and to make the, uh, to sustain that series, that, 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 that sense of threat after the revelation of the murder, that's something that's very hard to do. And that's the flaw that lies at the heart of the murder mystery. The fact that until the murder is, murderer is named, it's the work of a universal evil. Un evil under the sun, evil under the sky, evil under the moon, evil, evil, evil. Something satanic and broad and elemental. And now it's just, you know, Morris McGillicuddy getting revenge for something he's uh, he, he's embezzling or he's um, sexual perversions or whatever. And to maintain that level of threat post revelation is quite a skill. And the best people try to do it and they always fail. <laughs> and that is what's interesting to me about the novel now. Ordinary novels have so many things wrong with them. Randall Jarry said, a novel is a fiction of uncertain length with something wrong with it. And uh, that is true of all our novels because, uh, well, I, I can give you theories about what that's so. Uh, I've got theories about the collective unconscious, but after I've finished speaking, you might want to see me locked up. Anyhow, <laughs> by a good psychiatrist, I hope, rather than a cop. And so, um, the, how has the modern writer dealt with, compensated for this loss of the elemental nature of evil that is in Count Bosco, that is in uh, James Mariani? Well, there are a number of things were done were become the procedural novel is very fascinating. And some people, uh, I, I read general fiction a lot and I read uh, detective novels, particularly on my digital reader and take it walking. And the, the Patricia Cornwall, I think procedurally is a remarkable novelist. So you've got to, if you're not a cop, it's almost worth becoming a cop, isn't it? Doing five years and then retiring with all these contacts that you can uh, 
Uh, but she, she of course, um, uh, is, is remarkable procedural, um, scientific uh, kind of novelist, crime novelist. Uh, the other method we've used, we've had to put our heroes in the police force, but they're all misfits. Have you notice that? Hardly any of them belong there. They've all been chucked out of the capital, whether it's Oslo or, or, or Stockholm. They're all in the provinces. They've all got a shadow behind them. None of them have a successful relationship, although Camilla Lackberg is a good writer. Her uh, detective has an ongoing relationship with a detective novelist. <laughs> and so her subliminal message she, she must have been dating when she started this because she's virtually saying, if you want a stable relationship as a cop, marry a detective writer. And uh, I don't know if she managed to uh, garner in the detective, the detective of her choice. But uh, then there's, of course, um, people like Hieronymus Bosch. What a great name for it. Hieronymus Bosch is this horrifying painter who believes that the whole world is damned and damns the whole world in his paintings most graphically. And this kid is called Hieronymus Bosch. He's a detective in LA. He, his mother was a murdered prostitute. He has been raised in homes. He's no good at relationships. They've all got, look at the, the number of them that, that's got a, a, a child. And even the detective with the Shetland, which I last, uh, watched last night on the ABC, he, he's, got, he's got a daughter and he doesn't have a wife. And that's because they're flawed. They, their wife is crime. They are married to the procedure. They are like... Holmes and Dr. Moriarty going over the falls. They're locked together with the crime. The crime is their, is their bride or their husband or their, um, and uh, there's no room for anyone other than their obsession. They are as obsessed as nearly as the killer. And in many ways, if you look at Steve Larson's uh, uh, scoundrel, uh, at least uh, detective. Um, uh, I keep on forgetting her name. I've got it written down here. But the aged memory. Oh, I hope that's working okay. Um, Can everyone hear? Oh, yeah. Can everyone hear on Zoom? All right, Tom's got his microphone here. Yes, I must. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm not so good as a silent movie, so. Carry uh, on, uh, Yes, uh, what about Harry Holler? Now, Harry Holler is the work of H-O-L-E, uh, is the work of Joe Nesbo, who's Norwegian. And Joe Nesbo has a very strong association with Australia, the other end of the earth. In fact, he says that I saw an interview with him on uh, YouTube in which he said that um, Harry Holler, the Norwegian detective, was invented on the way on a long flight from Norway to Australia. Jet lag will do it to you. But Harry Holler is, a, a, if you read him, you know that he's a uh, man of very uncertain sobriety whether it comes to drugs or booze, of disastrous relationships. And only one thing means anything to him, and that's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, you know, pursuing the criminal. And he is in many ways, as Joan Nesbo says, he is in many ways, in some areas, more a criminal than some of the criminals he produced. He has committed crimes himself. And the same is true of the Stieg Larsen um, pieces with Lisbeth Solander. That's right. I nearly call her Solander. Lisbeth Solander, who's a, who also commits crimes, also commits murders, 
in a good cause, but murders. There's no good cause. There's no good cause when the uh, hero does them, but you've got to give your detective a good reason for any murders he commits. Uh, and uh, if her villains are mad, then she's actually madder than them. And this is the, the interesting move from, from um, the Victorian Conan Doyle. His detective has flaws. The detective in um, the, the Slooper in the Wilkie Collins novel, The Woman in White, uh, doesn't, but Holmes does, but they're minor flaws because taking cocaine at that period of history wasn't a criminal um, uh, uh, criminal exercise. You could take, I mean, nearly everyone with laudanum drank opium very commonly in the form of laudanum. Uh, everyone with tuberculosis ease themselves into the next life. That's why um, I think the Shelley says, I, I was, I think it's Shelley, I was half in love with the Eastwood death. There was this view all the uh, tuberculosis people had that they'd flow out easily on a tide of laudanum. It wasn't so. Laudanum, though, did control their terrible cough. And so it wasn't a crime to take cocaine. It was a crime then and now to play the violin. <laughs> but, um, uh, modern writers have very skillfully taken the few flaws in uh, Sherlock Holmes and have made them many flaws in their characters. And even the dyslexia, the, the person on the spectrum, uh, Sherlock Holmes was a bloke on, I mean, a lot of writers of people on the spectrum, you know, on that Asperger's autism spectrum. Uh, and um, I found out to my amazement that Quentin Tarantino is one. And he's quite markedly, uh, that's why he gets such jolly sound of graphic death. Anyhow, um, the, uh, oh, and that is the way the modern writer deals with the problem. And yet we still want, the more evil you can make your baddie, it's still the best. Put him on the Hitler side of, of, of uh, uh, badness rather than on the uh, Aboriginal car thief side of badness. There are people doing time for car theft who shouldn't, as Ned Kelly did. Ned Kelly did borrow a horse once and, and was arrested and tried for it. And uh, sometimes Aborigines do take cars, but they're cars that belong to their cousins and they assume corporate ownership and they drive them off. And I know at least one man who suicided in prison for doing that. So that's the sort of crime that is easier to identify. So make your criminal as evil as you can and then make the revolution, keep him still evil or her, of course, still evil after the revelation and cling on to evil as much as you can and pretend that forensics is infallible because we know from the trial of... Um, the dingo uh, case uh, that uh, we we know that even a forensic scientist from Oxford can mistake spray put on in a factory for fetal blood. So forensic is just as faulty a process. It depends on the person forensic being incorruptible either internally by his own vanity or incorruptible by not being influenced. And uh, that's not the truth either. But let's cling to forensics because if forensics is taken away, 
Evil's been taken away, forensics is taken away. What are we going to do next? I don't know. In any case, these few reflections, and I hope a few words of advice uh, given by a Tyro detective story writer are of use to you. Thank you very much, Tom. Now, we have um, time for questions and uh, plenty of time for questions, actually. And um, I will start by asking anyone in the room if you have a question for Tom. While you're thinking about that, perhaps I can ask you, Tom, I, I found all that extremely interesting and the fact that the heroes have become more flawed and the villains have become more victimised. Yeah. So it seems to me that either the person in their life or the writer in the construction of a novel has to reach a point where that person makes a decision about where, whether to pursue good or bad yeah. in their life. Because, okay, you explained about um, mm. Hitler might have been saved if he'd gone to art school, but not everyone who doesn't go to art school, not everyone who has becomes a parent Hitler. beat them becomes yeah. a tyrant or a you know yes. ma mass murderer. So, at, at what point? I mean, this must be a very interesting thing to talk and think about as a writer. At what point does that turn happen? Yes. Now, if I could answer that, I'd be a deity, <laughs> and um, uh, I think it is if I might drag in the notorious Schindler novel, in Schindler had two motivations to be what he was. One was to be really rich. And the other was to rescue his workers. And at what point did the really rich uh, issue, wanting to be really rich, gazump saving the workers? And at what point did the desire to save life gazump the wanting to be really rich? And every Schindler prisoner, I've uh, been in rooms where Schindler prisoners debated this, where a bloke said, you've got to remember, he did very well out of us. We, you know, he fed us, he didn't, he kept the SS off the factory floor. So they, they couldn't intervene when they saw us screwing up with machines, but, right enough, but we did a lot of good for him. And then someone else says, on the other hand, you know, where else were you going to be fed in the winter of 44, 45, where, where else was, and they point to their wife, she, she was in, in a bed in the boiler room with typhus till the day before the war ended. Where, where else in the right could she have survived? So they argue about where the emphasis between opportunism, the fulcrum point between opportunism and virtue lies. And I think that is the case in every, uh, the case in every crime. Uh, we could both be lawyers for um, a particular murderer and both have be defending him, but both have different views of how much of him is victim and how much of him is perpetrator. And, uh, you know, you have to try, I don't think you have to necessarily uh, explain it. I think it can remain a mystery. I think it's remaining a mystery. I think even you could have a debate between two people one of whom says, there is absolute evil. I have smelt the sulfur, as someone said. I, I think someone said that to me. Now, there's a man who spoke to me before who was quoting a former police chief who told him that, yes, there is evil, qua evil. Who was that? Was he in, is he in the other uh, room? He must be in the other room. Yes, and so... Uh, <clears throat> A, a lot of policemen say, yes, you do meet people who are 
who are as purely evil as you can get. Um, but even with some of these child abusing people in the Boy Scouts and the churches and so on, when you find out they've been victims in their own turn, you see why they're so immune to understanding that what they've done is terrible. It is a symptom of being an abuser, as a lawyer said to me, that you can never get them to admit they've done anything wrong. And a lot of abusers believe that maybe other abusers did wrong, but the kids they've abused actually benefited from it. And that's why you've got organizations like uh, uh, North American Man Boy Love Association, who are apologists for relationships between men and, and boys and say it does the boys good. And so, um, just where we, we don't know, it is beyond our wisdom to know where the point at which a particular perpetrator is a victim ends and malice begins. But you ought to try to make him really malice, you know. There's a bit of a difference be between uh, giving a victim an overdose and putting them in a tub of scorpions and putting the lid down on it. <laughs> Is there an audience question? Yes. I was told many Australians have had an exhausting week uh, watching the progress of the US election. And several regular colleagues of mine have felt that because so much was at stake, they described it as feeling like a fight between good and evil. And you described earlier the detective novels as having this build up of universal evil only to be revealed by this sort of mediocre, banal, Morris from Yellowcutty type figure. I just wondered, do you, do you think perhaps we've lived through a week of a weird type of crime novels? <laughs> I'll just repeat that question briefly. Uh, has the US election been a kind of uh, crime, universal crime novel with a battle between good and evil? Yes, it has. I, I don't see why murder shouldn't be bacteriological. Uh, but you know, the other day I had the experience, <clears throat> Trump's concession speech. Now, if you're people of a certain type, you know, old pinkos like me, you detest Trump and you'd love to believe that he was the walking uh, personification of evil. But then he uh, appears on that at the press conference where he was supposed to concede defeat the other day. And he is so palpably an abused child that there's too much abused child there to hate him. I wanted, I was saying to him, go back to the mongrel you were. <laughs> so even in the, yes, the, uh, that reflection on the US election, it's like that. You get a bit disappointed when you realize, uh, when you see the child, it's the first time I've seen the child in Trump's face. It has remained consistently self-conceited beyond what most of us would dare, narcissistic, smart aleck, contemptuous sort of face that you just want to rule out and he's a poster boy for everything that takes, that divides society. And therefore he is a Satan. And you want him to, rem you get to a position where you want him to remain that way <laughs> and keep acting the part. He was far too vulnerable, I thought, in his earlier speech. But then he mentions all the lawyers he's going to <clears throat> put to work and you lose sympathy for him. So I hope those, uh, that helps your reflections. It does seem a bit as though politics is the one area where people still like to hate and see good and evil, don't they, rather than in crime. But I, um, narcissism and empathy, of course, are two terms we use a lot in discussing psychology now. Yes. Are they qualities you use in writing crime or writing fiction in general? 
as, as sources of good and evil? Uh, yes. Um, yes, I, I like fallen. You see, as, as you probably know, I was raised a Catholic and then I studied for the priesthood <clears throat> with um, some very interesting men, your friend, Eddie Campion. Now, Eddie Campion is beloved by everyone. I, I don't know anyone who hates him. And he's a priest I studied with. And he became, uh, he, you know, he's the Blake. I, I hope to be buried in the Catholic Church because I, I don't want to offend those of you who are devout Catholics, but if you want the drunks of your childhood to turn up to your funeral, you have to be buried in the Catholic Church because they're the ones that come to the Mass, as a matter of course, <laughs> and then go on to the wake. And Eddie Campion's going to bury me, and that'll be a signal to all the decadent, my decadent contemporaries, to, to appear. And um, so every time I see him at a party, I say, don't drink too much, Eddie. Eddie, you've got to, you've got to bury me. <laughs> and uh, the, um, yeah, I, I, where was I going with that? Uh, I, I, I'm taking, I, I'm taking audience time. So perhaps I'll just move. It was about narcissism and empathy, uh, yes. but yeah. should I move on to another yes. interesting question here from some... I hope what I said there reflect, gave some insight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was. wish you the ending that you want. Yes, <laughs> let indeed. me just say. <laughs> I used to remember what the ending was. <laughs> <laughs> so Kathy on Zoom has asked, Tom, is there a pathological medical criterion of evil? Not that uh, I, every psychiatrist I've met and every social worker tries to avoid <clears throat> the concept of evil because it gets in the way of treatment. Uh, and uh, yet the churches in Australia, if you grew up in Australia, well, most churches everywhere, fairly fundamentalist, you know. So our problem was um, at St. Pat Strathfield. If you saw a reflection of a girl's lingerie in her patent leather shoes and you thought that looks interesting you went to hell you went straight to hell and so there was no excuse for that there's no there's no one there to say come on father it was only the reflection of the patent leather shoe or a reflection of the lingerie um, give give the poor kid a break uh, and uh, so if you went to confession you believed in absolute evil and that you had been absolutely evil. It was so easy to go to hell. Going to a Protestant friend's picnic on a Sunday and missing mass would send you to hell on the way back. Mm. And the Pope made the concept, beefed up the concept of hell when he decided in 1908 that the, the, the confession was to be broached, the confessional was to be broached by seven-year-olds. The age of reason was seven, not 13. In the 19th century, they used to leave it till you were 13 before you went to confession. And so you had whole generations of little kids in low churches the low Irish Catholic Church of Australia, the low Anglo Anglican Church of Australia, the other low churches and nonconformist churches of Australia, all going to hell at the age of seven. You know, that does something to a kid. And it certainly convinces you that evil is out there. And so my lifetime has been quite an education in the concept of... Um, concept of evil. I've had, for example, uh, in Eritrea, where Fred Hollows used to be, be there was a, an extraordinary rebel leader <coughs> called um, <coughs> Asaya Safoki, who ran a very successful revolution against 
uh, Mengistu's Ethiopians and who freed Eritrea. And when Fred met him and when I met him, we met a man who was not interested in the cult of person at all. In fact, he was avowedly against it. And he was a great, great leader. He and his generals were not national figures amongst the Eritreans. You didn't see their pictures anywhere. They were against the cult of personality that Mao had had and that Ho Chi Minh had had and or so on. And, uh, and yet he turned when he came to power into the man who suppressed Eritrean freedom to the extent that Eritreans were plenteous in the boats that crossed the Mediterranean. So he is responsible for the death of many uh, Eritreans. And, uh, you know, th there is the, the complete, the brilliant guerrilla leader who was very conscious, not as a sin, but as a huge political error of the cult of personality. And he's hugely virtuous. But I always looked at him and I thought, you know, I just hope you're not Robespierre. Mm. And he was Robespierre. Mm. And he's, de he, he's denounced by Amnesty International as Robespierre. But he did good one thing, one good thing, he ended the war four or five months ago, or no, earlier, the war with Eritrea, with, sorry, with Ethiopia. Mm. He's a tough guy. This is a tiny country of about four million, uh, defeated in pitch battle and in guerrilla warfare, a country of 90 million. Uh, that does uh, take some doing. No, just so, uh, sorry, make so time. there you've got the, the is there Are there any more questions in the room? Um, okay, let's, we've got time for one or two more if we're quick. Thank you. Yes. Yes. That's just a question about Hannah Arendt's. Hannah the, Arendt's and her famous statement about the banality of evil. It is true that ordinary men and women committed those crimes. It is true that if you put a high-powered weapon, if you can strip children from high school and send them into a civil war with a high-powered weapon, which they don't fully know how to use, and you tell them that the people you meet, as I think many armies do tell them this, that they say they don't, the, the people, the rebel side, they're all bad, you know, they're all behind it. They're all subhuman, they're all banditti. And the unborn child is the unborn terrorist in the woman's womb and deserves no, um, uh, no mercy. And so what happens on battle, what happens on battlefields is that pregnant women get bayoneted the women who live in the town behind the front line who are pregnant and are caught are raped and bayoneted because of the conditioning the young soldier has. So you think of a young SS man. I don't know the answer to this. What, could I have been an effective SS man? That is, could I have killed Jews? If you were raised in under the high inflation of the 1920s when families were wiped out, and you then believed it when uh, Hitler latched into this universal and frantic anti-Semitism, which has always characterized mainland Europe and even places like Australia, but, but not as monolithic as in Australia. We're too busy. So, as someone said, mate, there's no anti-Semitism in Australia. 
we're too busy hating everyone to hate anyone in particular. Uh, well, can you be through family trauma and through conditioning when it comes to facing the individual Jew who's part of the in international Jewish conspiracy, but he's just a bootmaker from Lodge. He doesn't have any part of any international conspiracy. And killing his wife and then killing his child. Can you do it? And ordinary men and women did. And that's why Hannah talked about the banality of evil. The worst deeds are done by sane men and women who love their mothers. Uh, so we look at the last Aboriginal massacre, which would make a great, a great movie and a great uh, novel. And it was 1928, and it went on for a year. Uh, the people up at Coniston Waters uh, on the border of Northern Territory and Western Australia uh, are uh, kill two dingo, a dingo hunter. Why he's polluting an ancient soak by processing dingo hides in it, a desert soak. As well as that, he's guilty of crimes against Aboriginal women. So they kill him. And then the entire tribe, without any due process, is hunted for a year, hunted by white settlers, led by a policeman who is a veteran of World War I. He's been a hero, and he's now leading. And he believes he's clearing the desert so it can be settled by pastoralists. He believes he's in the right. He's got no doubts about it. In 1928, after all the savagery of World War II uh, and World War I. And that is very interesting and again shows how good and evil are uh, cheek by jowl, heroism and cowardice are cheek by jowl, as we may be beginning to find out <clears throat> with these men in the SAS. It's not funny how men who commit crimes in war, it's good that they are subject to authority. But the politicians who sent them and the officers who depict the opposition as subhuman, they're never tried. Tom, uh, we're going I to have to- I hope my remarks make yeah. sense. I'm glad I got here just on the heels of dementia. <laughs> I think you've got a long way to go. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I, before we thank Tom, I'll just tell you that he will be available to sign copies of some of his many books in the um, bookshop next to the or next to the State Library bookshop opposite the Library Cafe. Uh, so if there are volunteers along the way to show you, if you don't know where that is, Zoom viewers can also buy books postage free today from the Library Bookshop. Go to the website, click shop books and gifts and find the bad festival list under the product tags. Um, please everyone leave the room. We've got to clear the room and bring the next lot in. And now thank you so much all of you for attending. Please join me in thanking Tom Connelly.